The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Rebecca Risk, and welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. I'm really excited to share this show with you. Uh, My main purpose is that I do feel that in our society, there are a lot of people that are unwell, and their doctors aren't able to help them. They're given complete bills of health, but their lab tests are normal, but they're in excruciating pain and debilitating fatigue and not able to work and live their full lives. And I feel like these people are falling through the cracks of our healthcare system, This is actually my story, and I want to share that with you today with a good friend of mine, Dr. Ashley Abs. Um, Dr. Abs, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, That's great. Um, So I I guess the main thing is for us to to talk about how we know each other. Um, We did go to school for Chinese medicine together many years ago, Um, so um, I guess... Since then, what has happened to your practice? What have you done? Uh, my practice is essentially fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, and pediatrics based. Um, it was kind of what came out of my studies uh, in acupuncture school in the direction that I wanted to go. Um, and through my own health experiences, I also have a subspecialty of autoimmune and Hashimoto's, in, mostly in relation to um, those areas that I, that I specialize in. Okay, so I guess um, one thing that happened to us both after school is that even though we, we study Chinese medicine, we both took that in a complete different direction. Um, for you, how did you get into the, the Hashimoto's? Uh, basically, I was working, um, while I was working with you, um, I was working with my fertility patients, and more and more of them were having um, test results come back saying that they had that and they were struggling to get pregnant. And at the time, I was getting really tired. Um, I was having a bunch of, like, weird eczema, psoriasis stuff happening. And uh, so I actually went in to look if I was celiac, and it came out that I was hypothyroid. And for whatever reason, I just didn't think that it was just that. So um, in talking with my doctor and um, kind of pushing to have some other testing done, it came back that I also had Hashimoto's. So that led me into a bit of self-discovery in how I could work with my own, knowing that one day that I wanted to get pregnant and carry to term a child, and uh, and at the same time also do a better job for my own patients. Okay, so um, can you tell us a little bit about what Hashimoto's is and what that looked like for you? Sure. So, I mean, Hashimoto's can have like... I don't even know the number. I think it's like 500 different symptoms. <laughs> that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it's pretty close of different symptoms. So everybody is a bit different. Um, more often than not, they experience um, what usually comes back as having that being diagnosed as hypothyroid. Um, but a lot of the time you're then given Synthroid or some other over-the-counter um, synthetic hormone to help your, to bring your TSH into balance, but that's only one part of the story. That's just kind of the tipping point, um, showing that something's not quite right. And a lot of people will get their TSH into an acceptable level and yet still feel tired, have skin issues, digestion issues, um, it, cognitive, uh, uh, the list goes on and on. And yet their doctor's like saying, telling them that 
their uh, that their lab values are fine. So you know, there's nothing that you can really do about it. Um, and then, if your doctor actually tests for your antibodies, which you know, there's three types of antibodies, um, which most doctors won't test for them. They don't necessarily see the point of it, um, being that. In, from a Western perspective, there isn't much they can do about it. They just give you more drugs until your thyroid is destroyed, and then you don't have it anymore. So, and you're just you just have a uh, sorry, I lost my word, but you basically you're just your thyroid is completely um, controlled by synthetic um, medication. Um, but it's your right to have those tests done because from other perspectives, there is much you can do to heal and possibly reverse your Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. That's, you know, that's quite interesting because doctors often don't look at that, that part um, of, of the Hashimoto's. They just want to get that one part they can control, the TSH, under control, which is, you know, very similar to um, what happened to me of not being able to get that um, proper diagnosis or doctor to look at my Lyme disease, um, which, you know, you and I went through our, our journeys together and you were trying to figure out your Hashimoto's and I was diagnosed with Lyme, which actually took me 14 years to get that diagnosis. Um, and by that time, just like the myriad of Hashimoto symptoms, Lyme I mean, I had over 120 symptoms, and they kept telling me that I was normal because all their tests that they did were normal, which I guess mirrors the Hashimoto's as well because your tests were always normal until they found that antibody, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, I, I guess that's where I feel that people do fall through the cracks um, just because they can't get help when they are so sick. I mean, I don't think we should be living with 120 symptoms and not have our doctors able, able to help us. It feels like some sort of gap there, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and the only reason why mine was, may, I mean, probably diagnosed sooner than it was. I mean, I would willing to bet that I probably had hypothyroid symptoms um, and with because, because of the Hashimoto's for, I would say, maybe about five years. But I had no idea at that time. I was just constantly told that my thyroid is normal, it's normal, it's normal, it's normal. And it wasn't until... Um, I had one abnormal test, like I said, when I went in to get tested for something else. Um, but then within six weeks, my test was back to normal. So it only did, got picked did up. Did you feel, one. sorry, did you feel at this point that there was something more going on than the TSH? Absolutely, and yeah. I just was like, there's something not quite right. And it came up. And uh, they didn't test for the antibodies at that time. And it's and then the next time that they did, my thyroid was, my TSH was actually normal, but I had the antibodies. And so, um, and I, the only reason why that happened is because I, I had information from my background working in alternative medicine to inquire further, which the general population doesn't have. You know, I consider myself extremely lucky um, because I have that information, but that, that isn't what most people experience. It's same for yourself, I would bet. Yeah, I think I think you and I had that that sort of window of where we were able to look a little further there because we knew that something wasn't right. I mean, I don't know if this happens to you, but in practice I find people come in and they say they feel normal until I ask more questions and then we're able to find um that they're not normal. They're just used to living the way that they are. Totally. You- yeah, so like, yeah. for example, fatigue is a big one that, that people experience, and they think it's normal to not have the energy when they get home from work to do, you know, cook dinner and clean up and participate in their families, and they think, oh, I just had a hard day. And uh, I know from my experience that it's not normal to be that tired. Yeah, I think we just, I, I, we tend to do words like aging or I'm just getting older or, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, And we just kind of start to accept that this is now our level of quality of life when ultimately there is actually an experience that individuals can have that is so much more than that. Uh, It's just kind of getting past that facade of what we've been told to to accept. Uh, And a lot of that is kind of digging deeper into... um, into what the causes of that are, and that may be through lab tests, and that may just be through like what 
the benefits that we have is through our own types of diagnosis that can link things together um, with different pattern recognition. Yeah, I guess Chinese medicine brings that a little different for us. Say we can look at um, different signs and symptoms, and you know we do the tongue and, and pulse diagnosis that can show us that something's wrong, even mm-hmm. with their lab tests are, are normal, and we're able to help them before they get an abnormal lab test, which really we would event, we don't want abnormal lab tests. That means we're we're crossing that line into a disease, right? Which mm-hmm. makes it makes it harder. Um, so I, I think, you know, one thing that, that's missing in our, our healthcare system is to help people not get well. We're very good when, when you're, uh, sorry, we're very good when you're not well, but we're, it's hard for us to turn that around. We yeah. just mask yeah. things. Yeah, I mean, and, essentially a test can't show anything until you're outside of, of the regular parameters of, of the testing. Um, and, and for some people that means that they're already very sick before that, you know, before they can ex- get treatment um, from, from some models of health care. Uh, whereas, the, I mean, that's why I practice the medicine that I do, um, and I made that choice back, back all those years ago, is because you could catch things sooner. You can use the tongue, you can use the pulse, you can use those symptoms to catalyze change um, before you, know, you can actually get better before they ever have to go down that road. Yeah, which I, I mean, I think is really important. I think in in our healthcare system, by the time you've crossed that line into having abnormal blood work, you are unwell, and your quality of life is very low. And I've had I, countless people come in who say, when once they're finally diagnosed with MS or thyroid or or whatever's going on, that they think they've had it for twenty years because of how unwell they felt, mm-hmm. but it took them that long to get diagnosed, and then they continue to feel unwell, and and I, I think that we can catch that in that 20-year period or whatever it is before that line gets crossed to turn that around. Absolutely. So, so do you, um, are you able to help people in, in your office to screen for certain things to test for and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, just given, I mean, given the nature of what I do, a lot of individuals are already coming. I mean, let's face it, we, just in our mind's eye, we always go to our doctor first. Um, and then we start, when that, when that doesn't work for us, then we tend to go down the other avenues. And so I have to say that for a lot of time, I'm the last resort for a lot of my patients. But I'm starting to see more and more people begin that process of, well, I just want to be make sure that I'm well and I'm balanced before I'm getting pregnant, um, you know, or I just want to have a healthy pregnancy. Um, and so from there, I can certainly tell, um, advise in how we can reduce the stresses in, in sometimes getting some lab values just to know that they're good um, because I think that sometimes that's also helpful. Um, but when I do think that there's, you know, something's kind of, ringing clear, then absolutely, then I'm, I'm the one that's initiating them to go talk to the doctor and advocate for themselves to um, get a particular test done, um, this one or that one, uh, depending on what we think needs to be addressed. Yeah, that, I mean, that's interesting, especially when we're looking at um, the, the Lyme world, for sure, that, um, you know, people are there's things going on and they need to get testing. Although getting tested for Lyme can be difficult and the tests itself don't work very well. Um, the, um, you know, we, we need to, to take that, that step forward for sure. Um, and, uh, and figure out what needs to be done for us not to, to be unwell. Um, which is nice about, about our medical system. I mean, with what I do treating people with, with more chronic things that's been going on for, for about, you know, 10, 20 years, and then they've got this myriad of things that, that we definitely have to um, work through. It's like these layers, right? Um, yeah. yeah, which, um, you know, adds its own complication. 
And then, you know, dealing with, with working with me and then working with their doctor of doing, like their family doctor of doing those tests and, and getting kind of answers and, and tweaking those things and working on trying to figure out what's going on and where the, the deeper issues are. Mm-hmm. So um, is, is that um, in, in your clinic um, a lot of what you're looking at as well of just trying to tweak things and trying to get them to that wellness balance? Absolutely. I mean, ultimately, I think that's, that's the goal is to make them feel well um, and also to move past the identity that they may have taken on having been sick. I think that, that the mental-emotional part is huge in that respect. Um, but uh, ultimately, I totally lost my train of thought, but <laughs> ultimately we, we, I want them to be well, and then I want them to feel that they can be successful in whatever the reason why they're walking through my door so that they can achieve the lifestyle and, and the life that they, they desire in that respect, whether that's a baby or a healthy pregnancy or just feeling well and getting their back to their center after they've had their babies and maybe experience a postpartum depression um, and, and ultimately just having a good quality of life, like a real good quality of life, not just one that they're going to settle for. Yeah, it's it's interesting that uh, what we do settle for and how we're, we're always on that um, that line of fatigue or pain and and uh, we think that, that that's normal and, and okay and definitely after the, the break that we're going to have shortly here we're going to delve more into that I think it's really important to to recognize that um, you know we don't have to have that fatigue and that pain and that depression or whatever is going on um, that there are other avenues if our, um, we can't get help otherwise um, for sure, that's um, uh, definitely a topic to to discuss um, mm-hmm. more. I think everybody's experienced that at some point yeah. in their lives, and um, we um, are, are, I think, used to it, and we're ingrained that if it's not better with just a few bits of medication, that um, that's what it's what is normal and what it what it should be. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Um, We're going to take a break shortly here and hear from um, our sponsors and uh, and then we'll we'll come back with uh, Dr. Abs and uh, and discuss that more. Much of the time, the illnesses that people feel are simply symptoms, and they mask the root cause of what the real health problem is. You can take back control of your own health, starting with Billionaire Healthcare. This program is hosted by Ashley Black and Dari Samia. Our program will introduce you to fascia, which is the knowledge of the living matrix. This bit of knowledge can bring you the health secrets that only the rich and famous have known until now. Listen Mondays at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. Ouch! What do you think of when you think of dental procedures? Well, when you think about it, the teeth and the rest of the body are strongly connected. What happens in one part affects the other. In the Tooth Body Connection with host Dr. Don Ewing, we'll explain more about these concepts as well as discuss the role that your teeth play in your overall health. You'll learn about amalgams and how removing them the wrong way can be toxic to your body. Tune in Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. We are bombarded daily with information about beauty products and anti-aging treatments. Do you know how they have been tested? Are they truly going to make a change or just take the change out of your pocket? Tune in to Shelly's Show and Tell with host Shelly Hancock. We'll bring you the top-rated skincare products and treatments tested by Real Transformation Skin Care Centers. We'll motivate you to make the best changes. Listen Mondays at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. Eastern on Voice America Health & Wellness. You 
are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to uh, Falling Through the Cracks. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk, and I'm sitting here with Dr. Abs. We are um, discussing today just being um, unwell and um, how to find your end point, your, your healthy point. So um, I guess what we want to talk about um, now is really you and I both went through our own health journeys and... Um, I think it's important for people to understand what getting well looks like. Um, I mean, what did what did overcoming the the Hashimoto symptoms look like for you? So, well, I'm going to preface that for me that it's a bit, still a bit of a process, um, and I mean, it's something that I'm going to be navigating probably for the rest of my life, um, just because of the way, kind of. With Hashimoto's, once you have it, you got it. <laughs> but um, for me, the the biggest part was actually getting that diagnosis. Um, so pushing my doctor to kick off the box to have my antibodies tested, um, rather than just settling for having hypothyroidism, because ninety percent of the hypothyroidism that we experience in North America is Hashimoto's. Um, so so. For them to actually do that, and uh, so that took a lot of advocating on on, on myself to do that. Um, once it was there, then it was kind of diving into what causes it and what um, exacerbates the the condition. And more often than not, what exacerbates the condition is inflammation. And so that was looking at my diet and looking at the foods that I was eating at that time um, that uh, were maybe creating more inflammation than I really needed. And so for me, that was cutting out gluten. Um, a bit so I want to, I'm going to interrupt you a little bit. I just want to talk about, there's some challenges that some some people um, experience when they have to go on this wellness path. And I know that our first step is always to talk about diet and gut health. And um, did you experience any difficulties when you had to change your diet? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, I did not really want to do that. Um, I do I do enjoy food. Um, so <laughs> it was not something that um, I was totally on board with. And I, and I actually just allowed myself the time to do it. Um, I know some individuals can just straightforward, just clean up their pantry and they're gluten-free or how, whatever certain intolerances that they have for life, and that is just not the case. It's just not in my constitutional nature um, where it is in somebody else's. So that, that was a process and not something that uh, I did overnight. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to lie, I still have issues and I struggle with it um, because when your household isn't eating the same way that you do, uh, it, it's hard. And you have to deal with the emotional issues of missing out on certain things or your favorites and, and acknowledging that even if you make it gluten-free, it may not taste the way that your old favorite was. Um, so that was probably, for all of it, I think that for me, just kind of working through the emotional parts of what it means to take care of myself was probably the biggest challenge um, in in all of it. Once once that switch has come, come then it's very fairly easy. But it doesn't. It for certain individuals that doesn't happen overnight. And and to know that if you are that individual, to allow yourself that process because this is a lifestyle change. This is a, this is something kind of for life. It's not oh I'll get better and then I'll just go back to the way I was living before. That that's really not possible. Uh, it's particularly with somebody with Hashimoto's. So, um, yeah, I mean, I had I had the same journey that I had to take. I had um, 
in my journey to find out that I did have Lyme disease, um, you know, it took 14 years and I looked at all these other options and I was told for 10 years that I just had candida and I had to clean up my diet and I did this strict diet for a long time, um, which, you know, helped a little bit. I mean, it, diet is important. But then when I was diagnosed with celiac disease, I was one of those people that probably annoys you that I could just flick that switch. <laughs> and, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and where you were struggling. But I see that in clinic a lot. There is those two groups where there's that this is my comfort food and my this is what I want to do. Like, you know, you, you're addicted to those foods. And it's, it's not socially acceptable to be avoiding things either. I mean, we're definitely yeah. in a, a pleasure-based society where we want that right here, right now. Absolutely. I think, like, for me, what I have found helpful in that is in my work in the five elements. And so acknowledging that I'm an earth element, I mean, in food, it's like an earth thing. Um, and there's nothing that makes an earth person happier than inviting people o- ho- over to enjoy a meal and have community in that sense. Whereas I, for you, you're a little bit more metal. So you have that ability to create that structure and routine. And so when I work with individuals where we have to maybe navigate these changes, it's also taking into consideration what um, what elemental nature they have so that we can draw on their strengths and at the same time work with where things are going to get hard. Because for every element, whether you're wood, fire, water, earth, or metal, you're going to possibly um, come up against things in a different way. And so it's just kind of, I, I find it's very helpful in that. And for me, Working with with my constitutional earth element has really helped allow me to create the freedom where I don't feel so tied to eating something at a bakery or whatever um, that you could just get um, and and stick to something that also is going to support me at the same time. Exactly. Um, so I, I guess one part of this as well is the way our society um, is, which makes it difficult for people to go through the long journey that, that you and I both have had to do. I mean, my journey to wellness after being bedridden took me three years to be able to exercise again and participate in my, my personal life and to do all those things. But um, I do find a lot of people come into my practice and they want to be better, you know, in less than the six weeks to their next follow up. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that comes from our, our drug age of take a pill and the pain is gone. Yes. And, uh, and I find that um, that doesn't set us up for, for things um, going very well in, when you have a long journey to get through these layers. I mean, just changing your diet. I mean, how long did it take you to, to mentally get through that process? A really long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. We were working together at the time. So I know it was a struggle for you. And you're not the only one, right? A lot of yeah, people absolutely. do struggle with that and um and we struggle with with every aspect of this i mean um it was after you got through that part for the hashimoto's what was your next step hmm let's see um so did you have to do any detoxing to to get the inflammation down and to deal with what was causing the inflammation uh, yeah, I, I've done some detoxing um, for, again, for my constitution, I have to be fairly slow with that. Um, it's just, just the way my body works. Again, other people can go fast and other people can go slow. Um, I have a sub uh, thing that's very common with Hashimoto's to have an, an MTHFR gene mutation, which makes detoxing very hard. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's just, it's taking the time it's not it's not a race um and and i mean i think that part of that is is us as practitioners managing those expectations for individuals but other individuals also just um when you're seeking treatment is to know that you didn't get here in a day you know that whatever has happened has taken the 10 the 5 20 years that um, it's taken for you to get to this point, and now you've got to slowly unravel um, all of the areas that it's been affected because it's now no, not just having that, that condition. It's what has that condition been and done to your body for the last 5 to 20 years, and you've got to unravel that 
before you're even really getting to the root cause. I mean, you're hoping to treat the root cause at the same time, but you, you have to find a way to get out of the chasing the symptoms, too. For sure. So you did mention detoxing, which I think in in my practice, especially with treating Lyme and chronic illnesses, is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, You probably don't do quite as much with the fertility, maybe a little bit in the beginning. Um, Not really. I mean, I do a little bit if it's necessary in the beginning. Um, I also have to be um, careful as to what, what my patient's goals are. So a lot of times, Detoxing and pregnancy don't really go together. And so for that, if if detoxing is necessary, then it means we're actually taking, trying to get pregnant off the table for a limited amount of time. And sometimes I'm racing to get the clock for that, and other times we've got all the time in the world. So it also kind of depends on what type of treatments, fertility treatments, um, my clients are, are going through, whether that's IVF, or uh, attaining a natural pregnancy through just natural conception. Um, each of those has its own type of um, way that in direction that we can go. And the same as uh, I do a lot of detoxing with failed attempts with um, drug protocols because we kind of have to move the liver to kind of move out that extra estrogen and all of those extra drugs that they had to take to stimulate their hormones to get as many eggs as they can. So it has its place, but not definitely not in the same realm that you do in your practice. Yeah, definitely. Um, I take that to a whole different approach. I mean, my mm-hmm. my whole journey with people is is yeah. detoxing. Um, when you look at uh, the toxicity of Lyme, that just that it being in your body creates huge amount of neurotoxins, and those symptoms from the neurotoxins are just as bad as the disease for a lot of people. So um, there's definitely layers to get through of helping them detox. And like you mentioned, that you have the MTHFR gene, so so that can that can definitely happen when people have trouble detoxing. So that's just a, a gene that makes it difficult for you to do that. So if somebody has a complication like that or if they have Lyme, their journey for detoxing is um, very slow and it, it can be very uncomfortable. I mean, my journey took me three years and I, I can't say I was comfortable for any bit of that, especially starting with the huge amount of pain and, and inflammation and fatigue that I had to start with. I had to um, to create some of that just to get to an end point, you know, and it was always going through new things one after other to get through the layers of the things that were there, right? Like um, I know with Hashimoto's, um, there can be other things that, that are in the way creating the inflammation. Like did you have to deal with candida at all to – to get through a certain yeah, point? Yeah, I think most most individuals, I, know, I would have to say probably most people in our society have to deal with <laughs> candida in some direction. Um, yes, um, dealing with candida. I've never had any physical symptoms of candida, um, but it, it, testing says that it's there. So uh, I definitely had to um, do some protocols in order to help minimize that. Yeah, and I I think that's always a starting point with any journey for me is looking at that gut health. So candida is an overgrowth in the gut, and it gets set up by, you know, taking antibiotics and and that kind of thing. And I I think um, just starting with that gut is a really important thing for people um, to you know, your gut's 80% of your immune system. So whatever you have going on, your immune system needs to be balanced, whether that's increasing it, if it's not working very well, like with, with Lyme, or to, to decrease it, like with the Hashimoto's when it was autoimmune and going, you know, over the top and doing the wrong things. We have to start at that point to get those things into balance. Yeah. Um, so at this point... Um, with the, the layers, I know the layers you go through are a little different than what I go through, but how long would you say it takes you to get to get through those layers and to get to that point? I think it just depends on how long somebody's been going through it. Um, you know, for somebody who... Because the interesting thing with Hashimoto's is for most women that get it, um, actually it, it usually experience it post-baby. 
So it's something, for some women, it's something in their pregnancy that, like, turns the switch and has this happen. Uh, and, and to remember that the antibodies don't just say attacking your thyroid, but they actually exist throughout your entire body in all of your cells. And so it, it doesn't necessarily just attack your thyroid. It can attack your ovaries and your gut. Um, and so a lot of women finally figure out that they have it um, when they're trying for their second baby. Um, I found out I had it. Some I obviously had some tests before I ever wanted to have a baby because I was diagnosed before. Um, so for my practice, it really depends. Um, if someone's willing to give me the time, I mean, we could take forever to do. Um, <laughs> you know, we could take a good three months to um, a year navigating this. Um, and other places, we get it to where it's stable. Um, so that they can then pursue a pregnancy. And and that really just depends on the severity of their symptoms. If they've got major gut stuff happening, candida symptoms, um, what we would deem maybe damp heat, you know, that needs to be addressed. It has to be addressed. We have to get them on a, on a good diet. We have to get them on good supplements to support their body, to allow them to detox. Um, you know, we'll do that for, you know, a good three months. Um, and then we'll look at... Um, how then moving forward into a conception state would look like. Well, that's It's interesting that the pregnancies can, can take such a burden on our, our bodies when it's something so natural. Um, you know, I wonder if there's a, an aspect of, of the way our society is um, just to set us up for, for being so toxic when we're doing something that, that's so ingrained in us. Yeah, I mean, I think part of that is, you know, it's just like our food isn't the same as it was. Um, you know, we're not, you know, a lot of women are choosing to work right up until the end, um, which puts its own burdens on ourselves. Um, we're not necessarily transitioning into that, from that made into mother archetype um, as easily, um, which I, I think has a lot to do with, um, you know, how postpartum can affect women. Um, I mean, there's we. I mean, there's a million reasons as to why why it could be. It is interesting that it does happen, but it is a very common place um, for for women to, to do that. And I think part of it is just because we are supporting that growing baby so much, and we're maybe not necessarily taking that same attention in self care for ourselves. The self care is important too. I think we're set up not to. Um, have self-care in our society. It's go, 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 especially for women who have families. I mean, we, we want to have it all and, and set ourselves up for, um, you know, having the career and the family and, and not taking time for ourselves, which um, is an important part of, of getting well is finding that that few minutes every day so that you don't become ill. And for you can't sure. I mean, we definitely still experience that martyrdom of motherhood that really just needs to go by the wayside um, because self-care is so important. I mean, mothers are the spiritual gatekeepers of their families, and so when they thrive, everybody thrives, but we kind of forget that, and we just want to do, do, do for everybody else and leave ourselves last, and it, it, it's not working for us anymore, um, not when we're working 40-hour or plus weeks. Uh, having our kids and and trying to make it to soccer practice all at the same time and dinner on the table by six. It's just we, we need to create that sense of space and sacredness for ourselves. Um, and that goes a long way. And, and a lot of my work is in creating that um, first and foremost and then moving on into the places where, you know, we can tweak diet and supplements and, and you know, all kind of the X, Y, Zs of, of, that, of health. Exactly. So we're going to talk about this a little more when we come back from our break, and uh, Dr. Abs will be with us then as well. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of Return to Peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. 
You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually, as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific, on Voice America Health & Wellness. Are you ready for a real, fact-based show about alternative and natural approaches to health? Listen for Live Healthy, Be Healthy with Drs. Jim and Janine Fox. We're not about the latest health fads. We're about proven methods from real patients and real situations. Each week's show is an eye-opening look behind the scenes of real health. Live Healthy, Be Healthy can be heard live every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Being here with Ariel and Shia Kane is an ordinary person's guide to modern-day enlightenment. This show is an exciting exploration which opens the door to living in the moment. Don't miss being here. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern with Ariel and Shia Kane right here on the 7th Wave Network. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. I'm Dr. Rebecca Risk, and I'm here with Dr. Ashley Abs. Um, we're just discussing um, how to find your way back into health. Um, so one of the, the one points I, wa- I definitely want to discuss is um, becoming your own advocate, which um, you, know, you and I both had to do. Um, we had to take our health into our own hands for sure. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about what, what you had to do when you were finally diagnosed with Hashimoto's? Sure. So, yeah, so for myself and all my patients, I can't stress enough how much you need to be an advocate for yourself. Um, gone are the days where we can just rely on our doctors to be able to, you know, get to everything. And, I mean, remember who we are. And I mean, we don't have the doctors that come to our house anymore uh, that knows your family and your your cousins and your all of that, um, and the medical system is stressed. So they're doing the best that they can, but you have to be responsible for yourself, and you need to um, just are willing to push to have those discussions so that you can have your answers um, to what you need, and um, and also get any type of testing that you, that you think that you might require, um, whether that's out of pocket or with your healthcare system, um, you know, w- navigating that. But really, you need to be able to be the, f- the first person that's concerned with your health. Yeah, I mean, this this part is really interesting for, for me. Um, with my, uh, before my Lyme diagnosis, I had seen over 30 doctors, and I actually, I mean, we're in Canada with a, a free healthcare system, but I spent tens of thousands of dollars trying to find a diagnosis or some help with with what was going on, and I, I wasn't taken seriously. Um, I was told uh, I was young and I'd get over whatever issue I was trying to talk about at that time. And um, it really took me pushing and spending the money for somebody to take me seriously, which I think is where a lot of people fall through through those gaps in our system because if your testing is normal, it doesn't matter how you feel. Um, they're, they don't know what to do, and I don't think that's a fault with the doctors. I think they legitimately do want to help us, but I think, you know, if they can't find it on the lab testing or it's something that, that's too new or, or not recognized, um, it, it's hard for them to find that direction uh, for us, and then we just kind of get put into the box of I don't know or, or that kind of thing, and they're not sure what, what to do with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, so with with my own diagnosis, I definitely had to step up and I, I had to treat myself. Uh, I mean, I had the, the knowledge already as a, a practitioner and a, 
a Chinese medicine herbalist and all of that. Um, but it was definitely a different world to me. And I think it, it is to anybody in, until they're kind of thrown into it. And um, it was probably the most difficult part of it was not having guidance from somebody. And I, I don't think that that's the way that um, other people should have to go through their journeys. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, for you and myself, we have the ability in the scope of practice that it allows us to have information at our fingertips and resources at our fingertips that the general public doesn't necessarily have. And so, I mean, I think for both of us, that has also kind of um, changed the way we, we treat and the type of population that we treat and how we treat them um, from uh, different from what we maybe learned in school because of that, so that other individuals don't have to be in the dark or alone in their diagnosis uh, so that they can have somebody to, you know, help guide them. Yeah, and I, I think that's important. I mean, one one thing that people struggle with, I mean, I went to 30 different doctors, but they were obviously the wrong 30. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm sure if I had known what more to look for, um, I I could have narrowed that down a little bit. And um, And I think that's important for people to know that when you're Looking for somebody to help you, whether it's your your family doctor or your um, a natural health practitioner, to to know what kind of questions to ask so that you're you're getting the right person. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you, yeah, any person should be looking, you know, ideally to find somebody that specializes in it, um, in a way that they treat. Can you afford it? <laughs> Because <laughs> it's not always um, covered in, by insurance, um, and if you can't, and maybe they are still the best person for you, for you to then, you know, work with them to find a way that you can still work with them. Um, I mean, I do that a lot with my clients. Um, we have, I have different kind of treatment models. Now, the less they see me, it then tends to mean that the more they have to do on their own and the more, you know, it could take longer. But if they are able to, you know, like we said, with different constitutional people, I know there's some people that can do that and some people that can't. And the ones that can, then, you know, absolutely, we can, you know, find a way that, that they, we can still work together and they can get better. Um, so, you know, those are probably two big ones for me. And then also um, having a rapport, like obviously you need to be able to trust the person that you're working with. If you're second guessing them all the time, now it's one thing if you have a, uh, you know, you're having difficulty with the, the protocol and that's just part of the protocol and part of that is to see it through. But you do have to have some genuine trust in your practitioner or doctor um, that they, they do have your best interest in, at heart in, in, um, in seeing you get well. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. the The relationship with your doctor is um, just as important as whether they specialize in what you're doing and they are able to help you. The, I mean, the financial part is really important as well. I think, um, especially with treating Lyme, which can take years. Um, you know, you can spend tens of thousands, like I did, just to get diagnosed. And then what do you do? Right? You don't have any money left. Mm-hmm. So um, it's important to find. Um, a practitioner that will also work within that so that you don't burn out and sell your house before you even get to the end point, which I've definitely, I've seen that happen. And, you know, then you have nothing and you don't have your health still because it, you have to be able to maintain your journey to wellness. Um, It's not this big sprint, right? If we sprint down the block, we're going to burn out. Um, And uh, that's not what um, getting well is about. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about taking it slow and working in, in all those parameters to make sure that, that they all um, fit together into what you can do and what you can afford and what works best for you. Yeah, I mean, you're co-creating a new life for yourself, and there needs to be a life after that. So you definitely need to be able to know that you're not going to be burnt out um, within, you know, within the first six months. And then what? Because uh, the other time, uh, the other part of this is, uh, I would assume, definitely for Lyme. I um, mean, obviously, with with my clients, I mean, they're wanting to get pregnant, and obviously, they want to be able to afford to have that baby. Um, 
But once you start, especially with the any detox protocols, you kind of have to keep going because if you start and then you stop, you're almost in a worse off place. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, because you've also you just touched that that tip there, and you stirred up some stuff, and then if if you have to stop because you didn't think it through or you don't have the finances, you're not going to get very far with that. Yes. And, and and even the family support as well. Like it really is like a full spectrum um, requirement to help uh, get you to health. And most of that is you know the individual, but you, you want to be able to have the finances, the the family, the you know that rapport with your doctor, so that you you feel like they um, can take you through this journey because it, it will be a physical, mental, emotional um, experience. And so you just need, you want to make sure that you have all of that in place. Well, one thing I think is um, important to note also is um, the distance to your, your practitioner. I know some people will always say, well, I want somebody that's close near me. And I know that that's not always um, the, the best solution. Sometimes, you know, the specialists or the best people are our next door neighbors. But most of the time, they're not. Um, whether you're in a small town or you're it just in a have such a specialized condition that there's not a lot of people that do specialize in that. And I think it's important for people to know that sometimes um, you do have to travel or you have to be treated by somebody that, that you're only going to meet once and then do like phone consults with or, or whatever works out with them in that way. Absolutely. I mean, technology is an amazing thing, which is not something we had access to 20 years ago um, or even less time than that. So, you know, to be able to know that um, somebody can, that's in a remote area can work with you or work with me, um, that there's tons of possibilities that rather than just making it in to, you know, for a weekly appointment, um, because, you know, sometimes that's great. And, and for me, I will often work with individuals that have people um, that are close to them, but ultimately I'm the one that um, kind of guiding the ship uh, based on my experience and expertise to um, create an overall health plan um, so that they are getting everything that they need and we're not missing something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I work with, with people all over Canada to treat Lyme because there's not a lot of us that specialize, especially not a lot of people that want to take the, the herbal more natural route. Um, mm-hmm. And so sometimes I, I don't meet people and sometimes I only meet them once and they'll they'll drive in or they'll talk on the phone. And I think, um, you know, that is important um, than going to somebody who's never treated Lyme and, and and taking that complicated disease on um, when it's not something that they've done before, which is where the specialties are important. But definitely having a practitioner near them that will work and report things because they're able to see that person more often than I can. And I, that's important, working with somebody else and, and, and that kind of thing so that we can get a full spectrum of, of what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it, every, all of these areas are invaluable. And, and, and two, like, uh, uh, I think that, you know, there is something to really making sure that you find somebody that um, is, is comfortable treating whatever um, health complication that you're experiencing. Because everybody is a bit different and everybody's experience is a bit different. And, you know, when you're at a level, like, for yourself having spent so much money and for so long, you know, at one point you're like, can somebody just get it? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> exactly. How much, can they how just how much money do you know do you need to spend in order to be able to get them the help you need? And and that is where, you know, working with special pieces is really helpful, um, so that, you know, you're not having to do more research uh, and know more. I like for a lot of my patients, they know already know a lot. Uh, Google is amazing and it's totally overwhelming for most of them and once they see me I put them on like a Google uh, diet and I'll have to be on it um but so I, th- I think this is a, a good place for, for us to um, end the show. I'm uh, well, just looking for somebody who can just get it. I think that that's great. Um, <laughs> I, I definitely want to thank you for, for joining us um, on Falling Through the Cracks. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, thank you so much. 
You're welcome. Thank you. It's such fun. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, this has been a great show, and uh, we hope to, you can tune in again next week. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio.